So last week I asked you guys to ask me some questions, and you did, and I just read over them, and I'm going to do my best to answer them. There are some good questions in there, and some that I'm not going to have some very good answers for, because it's on topics I don't know. But let's go ahead, and we'll start at the first one, and work our way through. So the first comment has three questions. The first one of which is, you know Logic Emu? I guess the short answer is no. Uh, this is, uh, I think, asking about um, logic gates and ors. Why are you not using Graphics Magic? Mainly I'm not using it because I've never heard of it till just now. Uh, I quickly googled it. It seems like it's very similar to Image Magic. It does a lot of uh, image conversion and manipulation from the shell. The commands look very similar to Image Magic. So at this point, why would I not use that instead of Image Magic? Um, they're both open source. The main reason I probably would stick with Image Magic is just because it's better known. There's a lot more documentation, it seems, out there. Now, as far as performance, I don't know if one's better than the other. Uh, if you had asked me before now uh, what license Image Magic was under, I would have guessed GPL, but it actually has its own Image Magic license, I believe, uh, according to Wikipedia, uh, where Graphics Magic uses the MIT license. And I couldn't tell you uh, if I have a preference over either of those licenses since I'm definitely not familiar with the Image magic license uh, but for right now I'm sticking with image magic just because I've used it and it's uh, very common and there's a lot of documentation out there for it why sometimes I see palm tree just inside your home there are no palm trees inside my house sometimes I film outside and there's palm trees I don't know if this is a joke question or serious but there's no palm trees inside my house you know Crypt Image and Color Modem? Uh, so this is another one I had to look up. They're both open source projects, uh, both with code up, I think, on GitHub when I searched it. And it has to do with uh, their projects that are um, uh, emulating or recreating um, analog TV signals, ones for encrypting analog TV signals. So like broadcast studios used to broadcast you know, your your TV shows and the signal will be encrypted in some cases and I guess this is, these are projects on that and I, I don't know anything about them, sorry. I'm going to summarize this next comment. Basically someone's running Debian 10.5, I guess they've tried both Mate and i3 uh, and it keeps logging out on them after every, uh, uh, you know, half an hour or so, we'll say, if they're not doing anything on the laptop. And they're wondering why they can't seem to solve the problem. They're wondering if, I think it's i3, uh, the uh, Light DM, which is the login manager, is it Debian, System D, Linux in general, or is it because he's using a laptop? It could be anything. Um, the things I would check first is uh, power management settings. Um, if you're in Mate, there might be some uh, power management settings in there. Uh, look at those. Uh, beyond that, uh, use something like PS. You know, look at processes are running. Is there anything running that shouldn't be running? You know, check your startups um, and see what's starting. Maybe there's a process starting that's logging you out. Uh, in the comment, you said logging out, not that the system's shutting down or turning off. Um, are you sure that it's logging you out, not just locking the screen? Um, but if it's logging you out, uh, you, you said that you're running LightDM, uh, the login manager. Um, I never heard of that doing that, but I usually remove that if I do an install that has it. I prefer to start off with a shell login, so just apt uninstall uh, LightDM, see if that helps. Um, but yeah, it, it could be a lot of different things, I really don't know, but that's where I would start. Look at power management settings. Although I don't think there's usually options to log you out, there's usually shutdown or hibernate options in there. Um, but there must be a process or something if it's logging you out. Now, if your computer's shutting down or turning off, uh, it's probably a power management thing, or maybe there's some sort of problem with your laptop. Uh, I really don't know. Uh, but those would be my suggestions on where to start off. I want to run 64-bit programs on my cell phone, but they require 4 gigs of RAM. My Android 2 gig RAM. Is there a pro any program, container, or anything to make the Windows application work on specific amount of RAM, like 400 megabytes? Question mark. I am really not sure why I said question mark at the end of reading that thing. I think it's just from doing voice text so much. Um, this question's a little confusing. First of all, you, uh, most phones are 64-bit processors. They're ARM processors, but they're 64-bit. I think you're meaning architecture instead of ARM. You're talking about x86. If you're trying to run an x86 application on an ARM processor, there's going to be some sort of emulation there. It seems like specifically you're trying to run Windows programs on an Android device, so in which case you would definitely need some sort of um, uh, emulation there. Uh, but as far as a program that makes 
another program that uses a certain amount of RAM use less RAM. If a program uses a certain amount of RAM, it uses a certain amount of RAM. The only way to really fix that would be to pre-change change the code, write it more efficiently, and recompile it if it's compiled, uh, which in this case, if we're talking about uh, something that's architecture specific, it seems like it is. Um, so no, I think you're looking for something that's uh, it's kind of impossible, but your question is a little vague in some ways. Um, but yeah, if you're trying to run Windows applications on an Android device, I've never looked into that. I would guess that there's probably emulators to run Windows, but yeah, if something's taking four gigs of RAM to run and you only have two gigs of RAM, there's not much you can do about that unless it's open source and you can write the code better and recompile it. Here's a fun one. Do you think Richard Stalin is a communist? I'm not going to go into detail on any of this. I'm assuming he means Richard Stallman. Um, and do I think he's a communist? I really don't know much about the man uh, other than um, his views on open source software. Or, I'm sorry, Richard, free software. And as far as uh, software is concerned, I agree almost completely with him. I think software should be free. I don't see why anyone would use proprietary software if they didn't have to, and very rarely do you need to. Um, so, do I think he's a communist? Outside of his software views, which are not communistic, uh, I don't think, I, I don't know anything about him. Uh, other than he is a little weird and a little rude, and but he's also a little straightforward. A little straightforward. He's very straightforward, uh, which is how he's gotten his message out over the years. Um, so, I, I can't you know, say anything about that. As far as people, some people say that, you know, free software, the GPL is commu communism. It, it's not. Uh, yeah, I don't think you understand what communism is if you think it is, or you just completely misunderstand free software. Yeah, so this one. No, I'm good. I already have lovely. Worst and best moments during pandemic. I don't know about best and worst moments, but I will say that I have found out that I really like curbside pickup for groceries, and I really miss just like little weekend getaways for a day or two. Are you still working as a fireman? Is Linux a hobby for you, or are you doing IT projects as a programmer or something? Can't remember when I subscribed, but it was a long time ago, around 2013, and FFmpeg brought me here. I still really like the content you make. You only like my content? You don't love my content? I'll have to work a little harder for you. Um, but no, I'm, thank you for being around for so long. I'm glad you're still enjoying my content. I am still a fireman, or as we're PC, you know, politically correct, we are called firefighters, uh, which I am not super PC with stuff, but firefighter just sounds cooler than fireman, if you ask me. Um, and yes, I'm still doing that, uh, you know, 17 years on the job, and, um, you know, Things are going good there. Do I do any type of programming professionally? No. You know, I do my YouTube videos. I write code all the time, but just to make my life easier, and I try to share that uh, with you. I post what I can on GitHub and Pastebin and in my videos. You know, anything I create to make my life easier, it might be something that other people could use too. I write a lot of scripts to help my job at work. Um, you know, we do a lot of stuff filling out forms and stuff. Uh, at work and lots of times the interfaces are horrible uh, and and the fire department hires these companies to make these horrible horrible interfaces luckily 80% of them are in the web browser so I can write simple little JavaScripts or sometimes even shell scripts that interact with these websites and um, just makes things easier because these companies make horrible hard interfaces and the people who are paying these companies aren't the ones that have to use the software and it's just easier for me to spend a little bit of time to improve upon them. And since they're web pages and they're written in HTML and JavaScript, it's very easy for me to, again, write a little plugin for my browser, a little extension for my browser that improves upon them. Uh, certain things like um, the company that does our scheduling and our calendar, well, they don't do it, but they, they create a web interface. Their web interface is horrible, especially on mobile devices. Luckily, uh, I was able to use some of their APIs and uh, set up my own interface on my own web server, and I've shared that with a lot of the guys at work, and they use them. And so it basically, my code just, you know, people, I give people a link, they go there, and it grabs you know, the calendar information and displays it in a nice, very simple, searchable format. Uh, and I've even started adding little avatars for people. Um, and there's a lot of other little things I do like that, that uh, I write for myself uh, to improve my job, but other people use them, but I don't do anything officially for the fire department. I've tried in the past and it's never worked out well. They much rather just 
dump a bunch of money on uh, some company that makes some cookie cutter software that doesn't work very well. But again, the people who make these decisions aren't the people who have to use the software. So what do they care, right? How are you? Good. And you? How did you learn everything about Linux? Have you ever studied at a university? What is your main job? Thank you for your great content, smiley face. You see, that guy knows where it's at. Great content, that's what I'm talking about. I make great content. <laughs> How did I learn about Linux? Uh, you know, I've told this story before, but uh, most people probably haven't seen it. Uh, back, you know, in high school, so late 90s, uh, a friend of mine, you know, I had heard of Linux. I had a friend who installed it on his computer for a little bit, but he couldn't figure out how to use it, and you know, that's the first time I heard about it. Uh, mid 2000s, so 2004, 2005, I was interested. I tried it once, twice, but you know, always went back to Windows because that's what I was used to. In 2006, I finally told myself, I'm going to try this Linux thing out. Because what would happen is I would try it, but then there'd be something I needed to do and I didn't know how to do it, so I'd go back to Windows and then I'd just never go back to Linux. So in 2006, I said, two weeks. I am not touching Windows for two weeks. I'm going to use Linux. If I need to do something, I'm going to figure out how to do it in Linux. After two weeks, the only thing I went back to Windows for was video editing. By 2010, I stopped using Windows altogether. Um, and as far as learning how to use it, you know, there's no books or anything I recommend. Uh, you know, I'm just not a book person. I find books and magazines, they have a lot of filler. Just give me the code with a couple of comments and I'll figure it out. I don't need five pages talking about the, you know, the code and then you show me an example code. Um, but that's just how I learned. Another thing I did, especially when I first started uh, learning Linux and learning the shell, is you know you go into shell, you start typing a command, you can hit tab to autocomplete it. I would hit A, hit tab, look at the list of commands, and start typing each one in to see what it does. If I couldn't figure out what it does, I'd look at the help file, couldn't figure out then, I'd look at, uh, you know, I'd Google it. And I'd just see, what does this program do? What does that program do? Just in my spare time, you know, there's so many commands that you probably don't even know exist that are on your computer, play with them. Other than that, when you have an issue, you know, you need to do something, look up how to do it. You know, it's, it's, it's that simple. Um, you know, just playing around and not being afraid. Uh, just remember, you know, as long as you back up your personal files, you could trash a Linux machine. As long as you have a copy on a USB drive handy, you plug it in, in 30 seconds you got a live system up and running. So it's not like you're going to be without a system if you trash it. Like, back in the day, I used Windows. I did, again, I played around with a lot. I messed a lot. I constantly was trashing my systems back then. The only thing is, especially today, you try to install a copy of Windows, it's going to take you 30 minutes to an hour to, to, before you even get to a usable desktop. It's not like that with Linux. It takes 30 seconds to boot an operating system, you know, a live system, and five to 10 minutes at most to install most of them. So yeah, just don't be afraid. That's uh, you know most things in life. Don't be afraid. Play around with it until you learn. I have never studied at a university. The only college I have is uh, you know the EMT classes I took for my work as for your next question, a firefighter. Hello, Chris. Could you list five or more GNU Linux commands you consider to be the most useful and among the most versatile? This is a great question. Um, you know, and it depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, but obviously, grep is super important. I mean, there's all the built-in commands for bash, you know, uh, or whatever shell you're using, you know, cat and that sort of stuff. But outside of that, uh, grep, sed, wget, or curl, um, so, but for me, two main app, one, one binary you need wherever you go, um, BusyBox. Okay, if you, if, I've talked about BusyBox before. BusyBox is a binary that you can compile and it has sometimes stripped down, but it has almost every command that you need to do 99% of the stuff you need to do. And if you, you can compile it with certain tools and, other, and not other tools, but when it's fully compiled, you'll have you know, web, brow uh, web browsers, web servers, uh, FTP servers, telnet servers, as well as clients for all those, DD, all, all your, your core commands are in BusyBox and it can be in a like one and a half megabyte file uh, or less. Uh, it's probably already on things like your router. My TV has it. I don't have access to it on my TV, but if you look in the manual, it lists uh, the, the open source software it uses and the licenses because they're required to do that. So my TV does have 
have BusyBox on it. Um, your phone most likely has BusyBox or maybe ToyBox, which is like someone trying to recreate BusyBox under a BSD license rather than a GPL license because people do that. Um, although it doesn't have as many tools or is as useful as BusyBox. BusyBox is also uh, can be compiled and you can get executables for Windows, although it's missing some of the tools, mostly the the server type stuff. There's no uh, web server, FTP server, or Telnet server in that binary, but it has most of your tools. It has um, stripped down versions of wget, awk, sed, um, and yeah, just most of your, even nmap, uh, netcat, not nmap, netcat, so if I talked about one tool that is essential, that is very useful, is BusyBox. But it's really just a package of tools, but very, very small. Again, one to one and a half megabytes. Uh, the next tool outside of that would be FZF. I've talked about that a lot lately. I've used it in all my scripts. Oh, uh, BusyBox also has a built-in shell. It's an Ash shell, which is similar to a Busy uh, uh, Bash shell. And in fact, on my flash drive that I carry on my keychain, let me get that out. I have this little one. I used to have a smaller one, but this one has USB-C on one side and standard USB on the other, so I can plug it into my phone or a computer. It has a uh, Ventoy on it and a bunch of ISOs. It's uh, 64 gigs, I think, so I have like five or six different ISOs on there, including Android, you know, Debian, um, Linux Mint, MX Linux, uh, Slit has Linux, but I also have a folder on there of tools for use on a Windows machine, and uh, two of those binaries are uh, BusyBox and FCF, and I'm pretty much set. I think I also have a copy of um, uh, Area, Ari yeah, Area, A R I A, uh, which is a program that's used for bulk downloading, but it also has a built-in torrent uh, client in it, so. Those are some tools that I have on me all the time. So even when I'm at a Windows machine, those, those few tools give me 90 some percent of what I need to do because Windows out of the box does nothing. Hi Chris, I recently installed FZF in my Debian PC and I'm trying to know how to search for files in my second hard drive mounted on forward slash MNT, thanks. So this is one of those things that um, probably could do a tutorial for, but FCF will, if you haven't watched my videos on it, search my videos on it, I've done a few, um, anything you pipe into it, it will make it a searchable list, a fuzzy searchable list, so you can type something similar to what you're looking for, but not, not exact, and it will filter it based on how close it is. So if you wanted to search for files, um, one of the things you can do is you can um, do the find command or list command, something like that, and then pipe it into FCF. So you can write a, an alias or, it, that, or a script that uh, basically does a find command on that hard drive and pipes it into FCF. And then the output would be whatever files you select. You can select one or more. After that, you know, you can uh, decide whether it opens it or not. Um, and for example, on my machine, I have uh, the O. If I'm at the shell and I type O and hit enter, it starts scanning. It does a scan on whatever directory I'm in, all the subdirectories, FCF, and then when I hit enter, it uses the uh, xdg-open command, which will open it by, with whatever file it is, with whatever the default program is for that file type. Um, so, I mean, I would have to do, before, besides just explaining it here, I would have to do a video on it, but check out my FCF videos. Go to my, uh, you know, filmsitechris.com, Chris with a K, link in the description, and uh, type FCF and see what videos come up. Uh, I've talked about it in other videos, but I'm pretty sure I've done at least one or two showing how FCF works. Also, when you install FCF, depending on how you install it, there might be some shortcuts already put into your system, such as with Z Shell or probably Bash as well. If I do a cert history search, it searches through the history using FCF. What does your network environment look like and how did you set it up? Storage, config, my network environment. I'm not really sure exactly what you mean by that, but uh, as far as like all the systems in my house, you know, I, you know, my wife's computers, my uh, my kids' computers, and a lot of little devices, a lot of ESP, uh, uh, ESP eight two six sixes around here. Um, but I have uh, actually over. Can you see it? In that corner, I just moved. I just rearranged my office. That yellow box back there, that yellow metal box, has two Raspberry Pis in it. 
uh, one just running regular Debian and uh, I have SSH enabled on that and if I, I use that to pivot into the rest of my network when I'm out and about um, and I also use it I have a I think that one has a four terabyte drive on it and I R sync stuff to it so most time I'm R syncing sometimes I SFTP or S copy stuff over to it um, uh, the other Raspberry Pi is running Nextcloud uh, which automatically syncs uh, from my phones and my desktop computer. My desktop computer also uh, has sync thing running on it, which syncs with my phone. So then stuff syncs from my phone to the next cloud server, but then also to my desktop. And then when I run my end, uh, my rsync uh, command, it takes those files also and recopies them over to the Debian server through SSH using rsync. So I have a little redundancy in my backups there. So like my phone synchronizes with one of the Raspberry Pis on my desktop, and then my desktop syncs with both the Raspberry Pis basically and my phone. So a little bit of redundancy there, which is always good with backups. Um, but as far as, you know, network... Okay, my eight gig SD card got full, which apparently means I have been talking for 20 minutes now. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, as far as like my physical network, I've got my modem, uh, it's a, uh, was it a, a Motorola Surf, you know, I, I bought off Amazon, uh, and it's connected to a wireless router that has four or five plugs on the back, uh, which is behind my TV in the other room, which is connected to a Raspberry Pi over there that's worked as a media center, and then I have a wire that runs through, goes in the ground here, and then goes up to a little network switch I have up there that goes to all my computers in the office here, and pretty much everything else is uh, Wi-Fi. Unix book recommendations. Not really. As I mentioned earlier, you know, when I first switched links, I tried, I bought a couple of books. Uh, or uh, even before that, I, you know, I read up on stuff. But it's just, I find I need to do something, I Google how to do it. Uh, reading books, I feel like it's just a bunch of filler to fill the books. And even books that I liked, it was because they had a couple of scripts in there I liked, and the rest of the book I didn't even read. So, no recommendations there, sorry. But I did once think about writing a Linux shell book or even a, just a code book and basically I was just picturing it as a book with each page having a separate script on it in different languages just this is what it does this is the code with a couple of comments and nothing else no other commentary or anything like that that would be a book I would buy please show how to run a script with system D when USB device connects. It's funny you ask that. I actually just saw a post about this sort of thing the other day and I put it on my list of things to do video tutorials on I would say look at this command and see if it works for you. So again, expect a tutorial on that in the future, but that's uh, a quick answer that might answer your question. Please, can you show how to integrate not much with mutt? I actually had not heard of not much till I read this comment the other day and I quickly searched for it and went on YouTube and watched uh, like a 45 minutes presentation from 2014 on the guy who created not much sounded very interesting it's something basically to filter and keep your inbox clean this is a very short version of what it does um, at the time of the video he talked about possible future integration into mutt I don't know if they ever reached that it does sound like an interesting project but not something that I'd be touching on anytime soon sorry hi Chris how do you manage security for Linux machines? Do you track passwords in a vault and are you using SSH keys for every machine? And what is the best practice for managing SSH keys? I don't consider myself a security professional, um, so I don't really have a lot of advice on this. Um, I do try to, on most of my machines, uh, utilize SSH keys rather than passwords, with few exceptions. Um, but uh, basically I just generate the keys on my computer and then use SSH ID copy or whatever the command is to push it to the servers. I don't know what you would do beyond that. Um, but again, that's not my field. But sometimes I feel like people overcomplicate stuff like this. Uh, but then again, there might be issues that I'm unaware of. How to create a new partition table on an SD card labeling multiple partitions. How to do that? Normally when I'm creating uh, you know, new partitions on a drive, I use um, FDisk. If you're not familiar with that, uh, I would just recommend looking into Gparted. There's a good chance it's on your system and it makes it very simple to repartition drives. That being said, uh, there was something interesting that some of my viewers brought up that I did not, I was unaware of 
up until recently, and I thought when they I, they told me this. So I was talking about using multiple partitions on a flash drive, and people told me, oh, you know, Windows won't recognize anything past the first partition on an external drive like that, or at least a flash drive or SD card. And I thought, Shh, they're wrong. Obviously, Windows would see the partitions. They must have, like, like if you get a Raspberry Pi, you'll have your boot partition, which is a, you know, a fat partition, and then your file system's on an EXT. And I thought, they have partitions that Windows doesn't recognize as the second partition, EXT. No, you can take a USB flash drive, make two partitions on it, both you know, FAT32 partitions, which Windows should see, and it will not see the second partition for some reason. That's just blew my mind. Anyway, beware of that. If you make multiple partitions, by default at least, there might be a way to get Windows to see extra partitions on devices like that, but it just ignores them. So if you ever want to have a secret partition, you can you can do that and Windows machines won't be able to see them, or just make them EXT4 partitions and Windows won't see them even if there's one partition. It will just be like, oh, do you want to erase this? Who is your favorite Linux YouTuber? Mine is you and Got Bletu. Got Bletu does some great YouTube videos. I haven't watched any of his videos in a couple of years. I used to subscribe to him, and I know he used to watch my videos because he used to comment on them. I don't know if he still does. If you do, hey, buddy. Um, main reason I don't watch his videos anymore is um, basically his language. Uh, he just had some foul language, and as a personal opinion, other people may feel different. I just didn't need to be hearing that. Uh, but as far as my favorite Linux YouTubers, I would say Luke Smith and... Um, Arthur Reader would be my two top Linux YouTubers right now. Here's a gentleman named Martin Parker who seems to have his own YouTube channel about Python coding. I'm not going to read his full comment, but his question is, what I would like to ask is how did you get started? How long have you been doing it? Is it your day job or not? What's your favorite language and why? Not 100% sure if he means how did I get started in programming or how did I get started in YouTube videos. Uh, the YouTube video answer is, in 2006 I started using Linux. I liked it a lot. I tried to get other people to convert to it, so I had someone else who started using it and I thought uh, they would be interested in seeing some videos on how powerful the shell is. I made a couple of videos for that person, put them on YouTube. That person never watched the videos. Other people did, and since people were watching them, I continued making them. As far as programming, I have always been interested in computers since I was really young. Um, when I was a kid, I'm not really sure what age, but I would say somewhere between 5 and 10, my family uh, got a computer, an IBM, old IBM DOS computer that had two large 5-inch floppy disks, did have an internal hard drive, probably not very big at all. And uh, when you boot it up, it was DOS, but it did have like a menu-based system on it. Uh, but, and it had a basic word processor and uh, a print master program where you could make greeting cards with large blocky images. Um, and I just loved messing around with it. And one of the things my dad taught me, which really probably wasn't necessary, was that when you shut down the machine, you should exit out of the menu, and which would bring you to a DOS prompt, and you should type exit before turning off the machine. That really probably wasn't that important to do, but, my thought was when I was a kid, uh, they put this computer in my bedroom, so it was kind of, it was the family computer, but it was kind of mine. And um, I knew, okay, I type exit and it would exit. I wondered what else it could do. So I just, as a kid, started typing all these words I knew. And occasionally I would get a word that, you know, most time would say command not found, but I know that copy and help and move, I think, were probably three commands I typed and it gave a different message. I still didn't know what to do, but I just was curious. And that's kind of my point is when it comes to anything in life, but especially computers, don't be afraid. Poke around, pick around, and, and don't worry about messing things up because at least with software, you know, hardware is a different thing, although it's still hard to mess up hardware. If it doesn't fit in the port, it doesn't go there is basically what hardware is when it comes to computers. But when it comes to software, as long as you have your personal files backed up, which is easy to do, storage is so cheap now, trash your system as often as possible until you get comfortable with getting it set up again. Um, if you don't break it and fix it, then you really don't know how it works. So that would be my suggestion. The next part of his question was, <laughs> well, how long have I been doing it? Um, you know, like I said, I've been playing around with computers my whole life. I think he also asked if I do it professionally. As I've already mentioned, I do not. Uh, it's just always been a hobby for, my, for me. And, uh, oh, what is my favorite programming language? Uh, that's a tricky one. Depends on what I'm going for. But really, uh, I would say I have two favorite programming languages. 
uh, Bash, you know, shell scripts in general, and JavaScript, uh, you know, which gets a lot of, uh, you know, complaints about from people uh, as far as like JavaScript being slow. But the stuff I write in it runs fast enough to do what I need to do. And for me, when it comes to software, people are very big on speed. It's got to be the fastest, which is true, but it also depends on what you're going for. And yeah, you should always try to write your code as efficient as possible, but speed is not at the top of my list for most of the programs I write. And that, that sounds horrible. It sounds like as a programmer, you shouldn't say that. But in reality, if I'm submitting a form or doing something like that where a user is interacting with it and it takes a tenth of a second rather than a hundredth of a second, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, if you're doing big calculations, yeah, you want it as fast as possible, and I should write the code as fast as possible, but I always say it's more important to write your code efficiently than the language you use. And when it comes to Bash and JavaScript, those are two things, especially JavaScript, is Orion every modern device. People can run it, I can send someone a link, they don't have to download or install anything, this application just runs. Most things you're gonna write nowadays are going to need to communicate with a server anyway, so the fact that it's in a web browser is irrelevant. Things JavaScript is on the client side, so it can run offline, unless you're running it as a backend, you know, like Node.js, um, but uh, it's just, the reason I like JavaScript is just that it's already on every device and it's easy for people to just load up the stuff I create without having to jump through hoops and download stuff that you know they don't know what they're downloading. And as far as Bash, it's just easy for system maintenance. Past that, I guess my next programming language, I like Python. I don't use it nearly as much as I used to. Uh, the main time I use Python is just basically interacting with hardware because it makes it very easy. There's some things that doing directly in Bash or JavaScript interacting with hardware uh, is a bit more difficult, so Python would be the way I go with that. I like your Caden Live videos. Thank you, I'm glad you like them. Uh, it's not the type of videos I normally make, but I did do them in the past, and I use Caden Live all the time. In fact, this video is being edited in Caden Live. How to learn regex, do you use it often? Regex, or regular expressions, are very, very useful. How do you learn them? Just by using them. I probably could be better with them, but here's the thing about regu regular expressions, is there are certain ones you're going to use all the time, and you learn those ones, and you use them all the time. If they're not ones you use all the time, sometimes it's just easier to pipe things into multiple commands and get it done. But if you know them, they are very powerful. How you learn them, again, it's just if you need them, you're going to use them often. If you use them often, you're going to learn them. Can a Linux CNC be installed in a virtual box? I want to say yes. I'm pretty sure that Linux CNC has directions on using it in virtual box. I could be wrong about that. Obviously, especially if you're going to be using uh, certain hardware ports, you might have to enable access to them in virtual box. But once you do that, I don't see why you couldn't, but uh, I would check out the Linux CNC website. How to detect all IoT switches, outlets, ring, etc. in a browser and terminal, CC camera, and so on. So if a device is on your network, you can just scan your network. Uh, you can do an ARP scan or Nmap is a good way to check. Also just you know log into your router. Your router should list all devices that are connected and have previously been connected. Uh, so that's how you find out where they are on your network. And then the next thing would be to do a port scan. Now certain you know, IoT devices can be accessed, uh, you know, through the web browser. Some can't. Some might have a port that you can connect through using like Netcat or Telnet. Uh, some you can't. It just depends on the device. Uh, my suggestion is before you buy a device, look up and see what people have discovered. If you already have a device, poke around. Again, Nmap's great thing. If you can get a copy of the firmware, a lot of them, you know, I think they download. I don't have a lot of IoT devices that I didn't create myself using like an ESP8266 chip, so I can't speak for a lot of them. But if you get these devices and there's nobody who's already picked them apart, that's what you got to do. See if you can get a copy of the firmware and then use something like Binwalk to extract them. I have videos on Binwalk. Check out my website. Again, link in the description, filmsochris.com. It's Chris with a K. Uh, pull apart the the... The, the firmware, see if it's running a web server, if it says what port, look for HTML files within that firmware, stuff like that. That's how you find out how this stuff works. Besides that, you know, just port scanning, and then other than that, taking the device apart, 
and looking for serial port connections. You can get a serial port, USB to serial uh, connector for like $2. Learn how to use it. I have videos on that as well. You know, check my site out for that. Um, but if you can find them, and a lot of devices, the cheaper devices are very easy to figure out. If you get something from Google, they're gonna hide that. They're not gonna have serial port connectors, connectors that are easy to find and all that stuff. So lots of times for me, going with the cheap Chinese knockoff, I hate using that term, but the cheap Chinese stuff is usually a lot easier because they make it easy for them to work on them, so it's easier for you to work on them even if they don't aren't advertising that feature to you. Uh, but other than that, that's that would be where I would start. Okay, it's kind of a long one, but basically he's asking about using an old Android phone as like a security camera or a dash cam in your car, that sort of thing. Okay, I can go on and on about this. I'm going to try not to, uh, but this is actually something I was trying to do just recently, is use an old Android phone as a dash cam in my car. I figured I already have them laying around. They have storage. They have a backup battery. They can connect to my Wi-Fi. I can auto use sync thing to sync things to my my desktop to keep the, the stuff clear on the phone. Okay, so Android is a system that uses Linux. Okay, so, so this is where the argument comes is, is Android Linux? Linux is part of Android. And 99% of the stuff you do in Linux can be done on Android, but there are a few things that are different, and it's mainly what I would call fake security. Uh, and a lot of that, and then sometimes it just does things are weird. So I was trying to do that. Um, I tried using Termux. If you haven't used Termux installed on your Android device, you will love it. It will give you a shell with most of the tools you will probably normally use easily to install. It does have some API connections that are supposed to be able to do a lot of stuff, interact with Android. Some of them work, some of them don't. One of them is being able to grab images and I think maybe video from your camera on your Android device. It has not worked for me. I always get black screens, black images, or very low contrast images. Uh, and this seems to be a common problem with a lot of phones with the Termux um, software to where it's just uh, the aperture, not the aperture, but the um, contrast, something is very low, you just, get, you just get black images. So I've tried looking at other options. You know, on a regular Linux device, if you are root, you can just usually, lots of times, just dump the raw data from certain web cameras. Can't do that, at least not on any of my Android devices. I then I tried to look into creating my own Android app, and I hate that. Uh, again, I, I could go on to, about this forever. APKs, so I can write stuff in C, Python, shell scripts, JavaScript, all this stuff, and get it to run on an Android device, no problem. I can write them right on there without having to install anything. I can do GUI interfaces, again, with HTML for any of these programming languages right on there. But if you want to create an APK, like actually create one, you're going to have to download the SDK, which is, I think it's one gig file download, and then it uncompresses to two, and then if you want to write something in C, which is what I was looking at, you need the NDK, which is a two gig file that uncompresses to a four gig file on your computer, and that's just, just to write a hello world, you need that. And then to create an APK hello world in, in Java, it's like you need like 10 different folders with multiple subfolders, config files, and all this junk just to say hello world on the screen and it is ridiculous and it's aggravating. I shouldn't need anything special. I should be able to write code and just push it to the phone. I shouldn't need anything special. The phone should already have everything it needs. I shouldn't have to download anything to my desktop. I should just be able to write code and push it over to the phone. But as far as APKs, that doesn't go. And to interact with certain features of hardware in Android, to the best of my knowledge, you need to do that because of app permission rather than user permission, which again is something that I think is ridiculous. Giving certain applications certain permissions is just stupid. Um, but I tried and tried. I, I wrote, tried writing my own applications. I use example codes uh, that were supposed to work and they would crash on me or they were older versions of Android, which is also ridiculous that it's changed that much. I also downloaded um, the, I think it was OpenCam. OpenCam is an open source it was, I either used OpenCam or SimpleCam. They're both open source applications. I wanted to look at the source code. And, and again, they are just, I don't know if all Java, I don't write stuff in Java often. It's just a mess. You got a hundred different files, config files. I would look at the GUI XML file. I go, okay, this, this is the dropdown. It's called this. I would search the rest of the code and not be able to find anything regarding it anywhere else in the code. Long story short, I gave up on it. <laughs> 
I tried asking people online for help, no one responded. If I'm gonna do a dash cam, I think the best bet is to spend $8 on an ESP32 that has a built-in SD card, and that way you have a device that has storage and Wi-Fi, and then you can access it from there. It's very sad that that's the state, and you would think that Android devices would be a little more usable, but that's where we're at with that, at least for me. If anyone knows any better, please let me know, but I went over, I even looked into uh, compiling my own Android kernel to see if I can change permissions and access the camera directly, uh, but I couldn't get it to compile properly for my phone. That's enough about talking about that. Could you do some videos on magnet reader writers and port forwarding? The person bought a domain and has had trouble getting it to port to his, or point to his computer. As far as magnet strip readers, I've already done that, at least ones that are HID devices. I have been meaning for about two or three years now to do a whole thing on HID devices, and because the drawback of the ones that are HID devices, they act like keyboards, is that you actually have to be in the field you want to fill in. I have written scripts that uh, allow you to swipe a card no matter where you are and have it run a certain command or put that text somewhere. As far as writing to a magnet strip, I've never done that because the writers are more expensive than the readers. You can get a reader for like 10 bucks the writers are probably 75 to hundred dollars and I really don't have a need for that as far as the port forwarding main reason I've never done a video on that before is because you go into the router settings and they all look different so me doing a tutorial on this is what it looks like wouldn't really help anybody but my suggestion is go into your router look for port forwarding sometimes it's under gaming because you need to port forward ports for certain gaming applications um, and basically it's just usually they'll say they'll have a column for your external port, where you want to go, what uh, IP you want to go to, and what port internally you want to go to. Uh, and once you do that, it should work, unless your ISP is blocking certain ports. Uh, I have had no problem. I've opened up port 80 on my uh, network before to test things out, and it's worked. Um, but I don't leave it open all the time because it, it might draw attention, Comcast might end up blocking it in the future. Um, but check your ISP, they might be blocking the port you're trying to use because I've heard of ISPs doing that. Would love to see a Clonezilla type Android backup, then wipe all the partitions, put Linux on it, then put everything back on the way it was stock. Probably mission impossible. As far as backing up a whole Android system, I've done videos on that before uh, using Fastboot. Uh, oh no, Fastboot will allow you to push the partitions back. Basically, once you get like something like Twerp uh, installed, you can DD or even just uh, ADB get partitions. Um, but although I do re recommend trying to get stock copies as well in case your copies go bad. Uh, but it's very easy, you, you would back them up just like you would any partition uh, on Linux. Uh, but there's multiple partitions, so make sure you get them all if you're gonna do this. Uh, I, as far as getting Linux installed on there, technically again, Android is running Linux, it is a Linux OS, and with the exception of some stupid security uh, decisions they made, you can do or reuse it like a regular Linux system. My suggestion is, because even if you wipe it and you put Linux on there, your big issue is going to be drivers. You're not going to be able to get all the hardware working um, unless you really know what you're doing. Uh, you can get Linux or you know your regular Linux distro, such as Debian, so as long as it supports your architecture, which Debian supports ARM architecture. Um, you can get running in a true root, which is not emulation. A lot of people think that's emulation. You're really running the Debian file system. You're just using the Android kernel, which is you want for your hardware support. Um, but I don't even bother doing that anymore. I used to, but I really suggest using Termux. Termux will let you do all your shell stuff. Uh, it even has, like I said, the APIs allow you to interact with Android somewhat, doing things like copying and pasting stuff in the clipboard, doing little pop-up notifications, but it already has most of the tools you'll probably need and gives you the ability to install others because it will let you use it like a regular Linux system. If you want, you know, for some reason to have a full Linux desktop on your phone, I really don't see the point of that, but you can do that. Uh, again, through a Chirrut, there's lots of projects out there, and Linux, I think, is one. Uh, but I think Termux actually has some options to get that up and running as well. I haven't really played with that. I've done the whole Chirrut thing on phones years ago, but I really just haven't had the need to once I had Termux installed. So, check that out. System 76 Opinions. Cool stories from being a firefighter. 
Uh, opinions on System76, those are the people who make Linux laptops, right? I don't have any. I've never bought any of the devices. I've never really looked at it. I think I went to their website once, and just like most systems that come with Linux pre-installed, they're just expensive. I personally think, uh, from the software side of things, uh, Linux runs on most devices already, and I think that's uh, more of a goal we should get when it comes to more of these lockdown devices. We shouldn't be trying to make hardware to fit Linux. We should be making Linux to fit hardware. Uh, not that it's bad to make hardware that comes with Linux pre-installed, uh, but uh, I think it's more important to get these devices that might be a little bit harder to get Linux on, just like we were just talking about with Android. If you could wipe Android and put a full uh, Linux distro on a phone, uh, you know, Debian or whatnot, without the Android backend, that would be great, and I think that should be more of a goal than making hardware specific uh, for Linux. As far as firefighter stories, I probably have a lot. Can't really think of any right now. Uh, there was one from years ago that I, I think I already did a video on years ago about putting out a fire uh, that there was a guy sleeping in this warehouse and uh, he woke up and walked out right in front of me, thought there was a hurricane because he was getting sprayed with the hose. Uh, that's the short version of that story, but uh, maybe I'll tell more in the future. This gentleman just asked me to talk about Linux on mobile devices. Linux and any level automation together Smart home in your vision, your personal Linux tips. Okay, Linux on mobile devices, as we kind of talked already, um, Android, uh, it's not, I, I really hate certain aspects of Android, uh, as I was talking about earlier, creating APKs. Um, and, and really the back end of Linux, it's just really weird, the whole file system structure, it's like, it seems like they were trying to do things temporary and just left them like that. It's just a mess where I think a regular, standard, uh, normal uh, Linux system, the file structure makes a lot more sense. Uh, I think it'd be great if the back end was more like a regular Linux system. I think Android, uh, as far as its interface, I think that's where, where Android really shines. Um, but Linux on mobile devices, you know, phones right now, I think your Android, as long as you get a device that you can unlock the bootloader. If you can unlock the bootloader, then you pretty much have the freedom to make whatever changes you want. Uh, so my suggestion is if you're going to get a phone or a tablet, uh, go to uh, Lineage OS or what's the other one, eFoundation, see what devices they support and buy devices that they support because if they're supported then that means they should be able to be unlocked and you can at least put a, a free version of Android on there. Uh, plus, I've been picking around with Android a lot and I've learned a lot about how to get rid of a lot of the proprietary applications on certain partitions. I need to do tutorials on that, you know, the stuff that you can't remove, that you can only disable and some you can't disable. Uh, they're actually pretty easy to get rid of once you've unlocked the bootloader. Again, uh, once you unlock the bootloader, it's like a desktop computer. You can make any changes you want as long as you know what to do. Uh, other than that, uh, Chrome OS. Okay, so I, I bought a Chromebook uh, two years ago. Or I got it for Christmas. Um, and I decided to give Chrome S a chance for a while. Um, you can run Android, or yeah, you can run Android applications on Chrome OS. And you can run Linux applications on Chrome OS. But the thing is, when you're running the Linux applications on Chrome OS, it's actually doing some sort of emulation. Now, you can install Crouton, which allows you to do a Linux true. And that's how I kind of know that uh, the Linux applications in the Chrome OS interface is a uh, some sort of emulation. Because if you actually go to the shell, which is easy to get to on a Chromebook, uh, you can use the, the uname command to see uh, what kernel you're running. And when, if you open up a shell in the Linux applications on the Chromebook, uh, first of all, the Linux applications on Chromebook take forever to open the first time you open them. And then they run faster after that. They load up faster. But if you open up the shell and you run that, you'll see that you're running a different kernel. So it's not running the actual kernel on the device. It's doing some sort of emulation, uh, which is probably why it takes forever to load that first time, because it's basically booting up a, a whole other system in the background. Um, that being said, uh, I think most, I can't really say, I've only got one, but most Chromebooks, um, you can wipe and install a full version of Linux on there and just get rid of the Chrome OS. Uh, and if you can't, you can at least get the crouton running. Um, so uh, I have noticed, uh, I was at um, Walmart the other day, and they had a, a Chromebook tablet. My, mine is a PC convertible tablet, but it's huge. This was a 10-inch tablet with a keyboard that disconnects, and then it's kind of lightweight like an Android tablet, but it was running uh, Chrome OS. As far as tablets go, if I can get one with Chrome OS over Android, I would, since one, it will run your Android apps if you really want that. Uh, but it, from my understanding, for at least my experience, uh, it's very easy to at least get a chur root 
and get a full desktop running that seems to run better than I've had experiences with Android in the past running, you know, Xorg, if that's the way you want to go, which on a tablet, I, I, I would go that route. Smart home and automation. Uh, I, basically like everything else in my life. So a lot of people will talk about like when I've done videos on like installing remote switches and controlling my, my TV or my lights with my phone, I get a lot of complaints from people going, oh, I tried a smart light bulb and then if I left my phone upstairs, I've got to go all the way upstairs and come back down just to turn my light on and off. Okay. So a lot of the complaints, oh, and then you've got these services that you need. A lot of the complaints about smart home stuff I get is from people making choices in their hardware that are limited. If you don't have full control over any device, then you're going to have problems at some point. Uh, they're kind of designed like that. Uh, my suggestion is learn about ES2 chips or ESP chips, ESP A266 or the newer ESP32 uh, chips. Very cheap, very easy to use, and you can create and automate a lot of things, and you are in full control. And as far as like the lights things, all my lights can either be controlled by a light switch or my phone or really any device that's connected to the network because I just use HTTP requests for them. Uh, so you could give me a Windows 95 machine with Netscape Navigator and I can turn my lights on and off with it if I can get it on my local network. Uh, so my views as far as uh, smart home and home automation stuff is just like everything else. Make sure you choose things that you have full control over so that you can make any changes you want and make it work the way you want. Otherwise, you're, you're going to have problems, you're going to have complaints, or you're just going to become complacent and just be like, that's the way it is. Personal Linux tips. Uh, I would say, you know, as far as learning Linux, uh, learning anything, as I've already said, just don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of breaking, because if you break it, that just gives you an opportunity to fix it and learn something new. Okay, let's break this one down into four parts. Do you think rolling release distros are the way to go these days for non-server use? I would say that's personal preference, but on all my local machines that other than my servers, I run Debian SID, which is a rolling release. I love not having to do an upgrade, you know, every year or two or being left behind. Um, and I don't necessarily recommend SID for everybody. Obviously, you wouldn't want to run SID on servers because it's the, the unstable version of Debian, but I've had very little to no problems running it on my desktop for probably at least eight years now. I've been going unstable with it on my laptops and my desktops, and uh, a few hiccups in the road here, but again, uh, it's a learning process. But at the same time, if you asked me the same question 10 years ago, I would have been like, what's a rolling release? Because I probably didn't know. Um, but I also, back in the day, and this is kind of because I was coming from a Windows world, but it still holds true on Linux, is it's kind of nice to start off from scratch every once in a while um, and just you know start with a clean system because you're going to have config files from programs you've installed and uninstalled or you know cached files from stuff and unless you're really good about cleaning them out they can build up after a while so you know sometimes it's nice just to wipe your machine and start from scratch so it's just a personal opinion what is the biggest usability issue you find in linux at the moment either for you or others absolutely none i, I know i'm sounding like a linux preachy guy but i can't think of anything that um i i prefer in Windows or Mac OS or whatever other or operating system out there. Linux does everything I, I want. It does it in the way I want because it lets me do it however I want. Uh, and I can't think of anything that I've heard of that I can't do on a Linux system. Um, and I'm sure there's cases out there where there might be this niche piece of software that does something that some rare person needs that can only be run on another operating system. But most of the time when people say, oh, I need this piece of software, or I have to have this piece of software, it's usually that they don't. There's usually an equivalent that usually works better on Linux, but they're used to certain things. And I always say, try not to get too set on anything. Um, you know, if you really, really love LibreOffice, you know, play around with other software, you know, other Office software, just in case for some reason you don't like that tomorrow, you can switch to something else. Just don't ever feel like you're dependent on any piece of software. If Linux went away, I guess I'd go to BSD next. I've never really used it, but uh, <laughs> that's how I feel. Suggestions on being a better public speaker. Confidence, and that's true in all aspects of life. Whatever you do, do it with confidence. You're going to mess up. We're all going to mess up. We're not perfect people. Accept that. 
be confident with it. And when you mess up, it's not going to be as big of a deal as if you're not being confident about it. People are going to notice it less if you're being confident in what you say. Don't be cocky. Don't be prideful. Realize that you're not going to always be right and just move on. And again, that's true with all aspects of life. If you are certain about something and you truly believe something, stick with it, argue with someone, argue with them with good points. And if they prove you wrong, accept it. Don't keep fighting because that's where you stand. But just be confident in all that you do and you're going to be a better speaker. You're going to learn better because you're not going to be nervous about learning the wrong thing. And you're just going to go further in life. It's one of those things, you know, I guess it's easier said than done. Um, it seems to me, let's like, I see people who aren't confident and it's just like, just, just move forward and be confident. Um, so I don't know what to tell you other than that, but I hope that helps. <laughs> the last little part of that didn't seem very confident, did it? Uh, this last part's a little embarrassing for me to read, but how can it be an IT guy and also well-built, well-groomed like you, etc.? I am pressed and surprised when I see you on camera. Thanks. No, oh, thanks to you too. Uh, well-groomed, I don't know, I, I, I guess. <laughs> I don't know if you know this, I cut my own hair, I have most of my life, so I'm surprised that uh, you consider me well-groomed. As, as far as uh, well-built, um, I work out. Uh, when I was 10, I bought my first comic, it was a Daredevil comic, in it he did some training, and I thought, hey, to be a superhero, you gotta work out. So I started working out, I've been working out since then. Um, I don't know what else to tell, if you wanna be well-built, you gotta, you gotta work out. Well-groomed, you know, take showers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what is the asterisk when you run the command FC-L50? I may not be 100% accurate on this because I had never ran this command or uh, noticed this before. So FC-L50 uh, brings up basically part of your history, the most recent things in your shell history. Uh, and um, I realized when I ran that, like he said, certain commands have little asterisks in the second column. And you want to know why. But I noticed it was all stuff that was recent, but not all of them. And what I've discovered is, and my first thought was, and I kind of tested this out, was those are things that were recently added in a shell that hasn't been closed out yet. What I mean by that, so I use Z shell. I'm not sure what shell this person's using. In Bash, at least by the default settings, you run commands and they're logged into history, but they don't log into history until you exit out of that shell. So if I have two shells open and I'm running commands over in this one, I go over here and I try to go up in the history, it's not gonna show the commands from that shell. Now in Z shell, at least with my configuration, as I'm running commands, every so often it updates. I don't know how often it updates, I know it's not immediate, but if I go to another shell, the commands I've been running in this shell will show up in this other shell, even though I haven't closed this one out yet. So I was thinking maybe that asterisk are the ones that were recently added in a shell that wasn't closed out. So I tested it out. I opened up a couple of shells, ran a couple of commands, ran the FC-L50 command, and the recent commands I ran all had asterisks in it. I closed out one of the shells, ran the command again, and all the commands that I had run in that shell now don't have asterisks in them. I closed out all the shells, opened up a new shell, ran the command again, and none of them had asterisks. So that's my assumption is that they're somehow marking commands that have been run, but they're, they, they've been run in a shell that's still open. But I didn't actually look that up, that's just from what I tried. When is your birthday? Your birthday is the day you were born. How do you prevent DDoS attacks against a Linux router? How can I close ports with IP tables and such? My router is off my phone and I have a static IP subscription to it, but I have a Linux kernel and sudo access. I really don't have a great answer for this one. Um, as far as DDoS attacks, it's something I've never had to worry about. Uh, I guess you can try blocking certain ranges of ports that, you know, if you know you're going to be connecting from a certain area, if you're the only one accessing this stuff remotely, uh, you can probably set a whitelist of IP tape, uh, IPs. Um, IP tables is something I've done very little with. I've done one or two videos on it, on adding and removing rules uh, and doing some port forwarding. Unfortunately, I, off the top of my head, I, I don't have any suggestions for you. Sorry. How I keep SSH connection alive is always disconnect connection to root host close. Well, if, if you Google it, you know, keeping SSH connections alive, uh, you'll find a lot of uh, websites basically talking about in your SSH uh, configuration, there's a, uh, a live option, I think it's called. It's, it's a heartbeat, basically. You can set how many seconds it sends a signal to the server. 
uh, and it will keep it open. And so you can make that number smaller so it sends more signals when you're not using the shell. It will send a signal every once in a while to keep you connected. Now if your network's dropping out, uh, I don't think that's going to help too much. I do remember a while ago seeing a couple of people talking on different websites about uh, another tool that uh, will do SSH connections for you and it's supposed to do a better job of not losing connections. Um, but uh, I, I personally have my computers here at home connected to uh, my Films by Chris server 24-7 and um, it rarely disconnects. The other thing is if you are continuously getting disconnected, definitely look into using Tmux. Not Termux that I was talking about earlier, but Tmux, T-M-U-X. It's kind of like screen. Screen would be another option. And that will allow you to keep your shell and processes alive even if you get disconnected. So next time you reconnect, everything is there waiting for you exactly how it was before you left. And you can also connect from multiple machines and leave all those connections open but still be interacting with the same shell. Okay, three more comments. Please, can you show how you can set BIOS clock to start up the PC and then run SyncThing command line version to sync files with Android phone at say 3 a.m., then shut down PC all automatically? Hmm, that's a good one. Uh, I have never heard of a BIOS settings that turns the computer on at a certain point. Certain point. I guess that could be possible, but I've never seen or heard of that. Uh, one thing that I have heard of, you know, is that I've never done myself, is um, starting up the computer with a network connection. This is called Wake on LAN. It's something I have not done, but I've read about before. It needs to be done through a physical Ethernet cable, as to the best of my knowledge, it can't be done over Wi-Fi. Um, and it takes some configuration and your computer BIOS either supports it or not. Uh, I think you also probably need a network card that supports it. Uh, and then you can have another computer set to turn that computer on and then you can just have a script running to start up sync thing when the computer starts and then shut down after a certain amount of time. Uh, the thing is sync things are constantly syncing so I don't know if you can set it to shut down when it's done because it's never done. Uh, but you can use an rsync command and say okay rsync and when the rsync is done then shut down. Uh, another option I guess would be you know to turn on a computer it's just you know pressing a button which is also just connecting wires so you could set up like like an Arduino uh, with a clock and have it at a certain time trigger the power on again and then the rest can be done with scripts running your sync program and then shutting down after it's done uh, but as far as just saying a computer to automatically turn on by itself I have not heard of that but people can comment below and let me know if I'm wrong I'm, I'm sure it might exist I just don't think most PCs have that built into the BIOS I'd really like the business I work in uh, to use Linux on their computers however I have a conflict before suggesting it because they have to use programs that are only available on Windows. Most of the ones exclusive to Windows they have one week of the year except for AutoCAD which is used for simple drawings on a daily basis. What infrastructure would you suggest? Yeah, isn't that the question? Trying to get a company you work for to switch to Linux. It's probably not going to happen. First of all, all that we need these applications is not true. There's plenty of open source CAD programs that run on Linux. Um, you know, I can't say for sure if there's a feature they may need that's in AutoCAD only. Um, but getting a company to switch to Linux, it's they're either going to or they're not. Uh, unless you're in the position of making that decision, getting someone to switch is is probably not going to happen because they all feel like they've been they've been brainwashed through commercials saying, "Oh, Windows is for business. You need Windows for business." I know so many people who own companies who. Uh, had to buy upgrade computers and spend thousand dollars on new computers just to get the new versions of running, running just so they can get the new version of access. I've known people who have used access for two decades now and they have to keep upgrading their computer to upgrade access and I know someone who bought a new computer once had to upgrade to the new version of access because uh, the old version didn't work on the new version of Windows uh, but they couldn't just upgrade to the new version because the old version they had was so uh, old they had to buy two copies of access access to upgrade their files to a medium uh, version of access and then to another version of access and it's just a mess but the people are so brainwashed into believing that's what they need to do and access is just databases databases are, are, are nothing you know unique or special but you get locked into these proprietary softwares and you feel like you have to but I, I can't tell you what to do you know is other than just whenever you can point out where their software is failing
So I'm, I'm editing this video and realize I didn't answer the last question on this comment, which is basically how do we get uh, companies like uh, Adobe to make their products for Linux? And my answer is we, we shouldn't want them to. The Linux community, why would we want more proprietary software on our open source system, on our free systems? You know, a lot of people, they're dependent on these Adobe programs, and Adobe programs, if you ask me, are horrible, many of them. Uh, I mean, even basic things like Adobe PDF Reader is so horrible compared to, and has so many security flaws compared to other PDF readers. But why would you want to be locked into some proprietary program? Most people will be like, oh, I need them because it, I, it, it's what we use. Uh, I'd be, I, I bet most people would be hard pressed to give me an answer if I asked what features in those programs do you need that we don't already have on Linux? And I'm sure there's probably something there, but uh, most people who say they need it don't really need it. They think they need it because they haven't looked into the open source alternatives, which uh, tend to be better in many cases. Um, you know, 10 years ago, video editing on Linux uh, and special effects, you know, using Linux systems was a little difficult, but between Blender and Caden Live, there's really, I can't think of anything that um, someone can do on a uh, Windows system that they can't do on a Linux system, and that's just where it comes to. But if you start moving all these proprietary programs over to Linux, people are gonna start using them, and then Linux is gonna start running like crap, just like Windows does, and we don't want that. That's why most people get away from Linux. If you want that stuff, if you don't care about software freedom, why are you on Linux? And the last comment is, did I miss this? No, you didn't, you made it in time, just in time. <laughs> last one, and it might be a little in left field, if we HCB supports a Debian framework, an app written in Node, can I run Google Play apps from the uh, Wii HBC kernel like Mike's 5? I don't know. And that ends that, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I, I don't really know. Uh, so Wii HBC is Wii Homebrew Community. I had to look that up. Uh, and uh, the question is basically, if you can get basically Linux running with Node, can you run Google Play apps? Okay, so my first question is, what do you mean by Google Play apps? Are you talking about, you know, Android specific applications? Um, or are you talking about the App Store? Or are you just talking about Android applications in general? Because you can get Android applications outside of uh, the Android Play services. Uh, and <clears throat> so if you have Linux, can you get Android uh, apps running on a Linux system natively. I feel like I've heard them talking about that eventually happening. I know Chromebooks can do it, but can I just start up a Android app natively on a, on a desktop Linux? Uh, I, I mean, if you're running Debian Linux on the device, then I, then I would say yes. Um, but if you can't, then you can't. Um, and I, I really don't know. So I wish the final question I had a better answer than that. Anyway. This took a lot longer than I expected, um, and this is a very long video, and I apologize for that, unless you guys liked it. Let me know. You made it here to the end. Uh, probably most of you didn't, but those of you who are here at the end, let me know. I thought about maybe splitting this into two videos, um, but then I decided just to do it all in one video, because most of my videos are short, and maybe a longer video will do well. Uh, maybe you all thought this was boring. Um, also, do you think there should be music in the background? I always feel like there should be music in the background so it drowns out the humming of my desktop computer, but then people always complain that there's music in the background. So I didn't put any music in the background of this video, unless I change my time, mind between now and the time that I finish editing this video. Maybe I'll do two versions. Anyway, thank you for your questions. Probably do this again in the future. Uh, I thank you. I wasn't sure if I was gonna get any comments or not, and I got plenty of them. So thanks again. I hope I answered your questions, and I hope you continue to enjoy my videos. Have a great day.